right, babe. That's a good workout. Yes. All right, you ready to get your Zumba on though? Absolutely, I am. All right, it's settled then. <laughs> hey guys, we have a very special event that we want you to join us in on. That's right. Zumba with the Pastors will be held right here in the Brooks parking lot, March 20th. So grab your workout gear and meet your Brooks fam here. All right, and fellas, check it out. It's not just for the ladies. We want you to join in as well. So grab your tickets. It's only five bucks. That's it there. Five bucks. <laughs> and all, all proceeds go directly toward Family Promise. All right, we look forward to seeing you there. All right, March 20th. See ya. See ya. Let's try it. One, one, two, one, two, three. Try it again, everybody. Oh God, oh God, oh, oh. my God, you reign victorious. Oh, stop, stop, stop. You Don't let this be you. Listen, if you have what we need, Echo needs your help. So send us a one minute video to echo at brookcity.org. We need you, we're waiting on you. Yeah, oh God, my, I can sing. Mm -mm. You ran. Okay, cut. What's up, Brooke family? Welcome to our online experience. I don't know about you, but I believe today's worship experience is going to be life changing. Hey, don't be stingy. Hit that share button. Help us get this experience to as many people as possible. While you're in the comments, do us a favor and let us know where you're worshiping. Give us your name, your city, and your state. Hey, I gotta let you know, Love Week is happening this week. Love Week's a big deal around here. We get an opportunity to give back to our community. So be on the lookout for volunteer opportunities and other things that are happening in the city. Are you excited about worship? I am. If you're new to the Brook, text new to Brook, N-E-W, the number two, B-R-O-O-K to 81811. Let's get into the sanctuary. It's time for worship. Lord, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I am so glad that you have decided to join us today and allow us into your homes to worship with you, to bless the Lord this morning, for he is good, 
He is wonderful. He is mighty. And we choose to believe him and rejoice in him today. So if you are glad that God has given you another opportunity to set your affection on him, another opportunity to worship him in your home, uninhibited, would you put something in the comments like, I'm glad for today. God has been good. I'm grateful for his love and his mercy. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for your love today. We thank you for your peace today. We thank you for your healing touch today. We thank you for your forgiveness and your mercy that endures forever. God, we appreciate that you woke us up this morning and are giving us strength and new mercies to make it throughout this day. I thank you that God, for everyone who will join in on this worship experience, that you would open up their hearts and open up their minds to receive your word today, to lift their hands wherever they are and bless your name because you are good, you are faithful, you are mighty, you are strong, you are all that we need and all we could ever ask and hope for comes from you. So thank you, good Father, for pouring out all of the things that we need this day. God, I ask that you would transform us by the power of your word and this worship today, that we would look more like you, that we would understand who we are and who you are and give you glory and honor and praise. Settle every issue. Quiet all the noise. Allow us to go into your presence with thanksgiving and joy and receive your word with faith and grow and become all that you have created us to become. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Somebody just give God glory right now wherever you are. He's been good all week. Can you just give him praise? Come on, wherever you are today, can you just give him glory? Come on. We serve an amazingly faithful God. And even if I just look back over what he's done this week, he has been wonderful. He has been mighty. He has been faithful. He has been my redeemer all week long. He has been my sustainer. He has been my provider. He has been my healer. He has been a present help in the time of trouble. So for that, we give your name the praise. Come on, wherever you are right now, can you just surrender worship to the Father? Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, glory and honor is due to you. All glory and honor is due to you. So we lift up our hands to you, Jesus. Hey. Come on, we lift up our voices to you, God. Oh, oh, oh. You are worthy, Jesus. You are holy, Father. You are everything we need. So we thank you for being. Prince of Peace, yes you are, Jesus. Come on, rejoice in the Lord. Because he's good to you. Because he's been good to you. Come on, can we just raise up a hallelujah?
if you're grateful, can you just say thank you, Jesus? Wherever you're watching this today, can you just say thank you? Come on, I need you to wake somebody up in your house with your worship. I need you to disrupt atmospheres by giving God glory. Because he's wonderful. I don't know about you, but God has kept me from some things that I wouldn't have been able to keep myself from. And so because of that fact, I owe God something. I came here today because I owe him something. I lift my voice because I owe him something. I lift my hands because I owe him something. And I don't know about you, but I believe there are about 2,000 people watching this right now that you owe God something. And so I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to just give him what he's doing. Come on, come on, come on. Can you clap your hands? Can you open up your mouth? Can you shout it to God? Can you give him the praise? Can you give him glory? God, we glorify you. Hey, God, we honor you. We praise your name. It's due to you. It's due to you, Father. Our praise is due. The glory is due. We honor you with the fruit of our lips. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for keeping us. I know I need to move on, but I can't stop praising him. I can't stop giving him glory. He's brought me through too many things. And I know he's bringing somebody through a situation right now. He's bringing you through cancer. He's bringing you through diabetes. He's bringing you through financial difficulties. So you all got the praise. And I'm gonna give it to you. I'm gonna give you the glory. I'm gonna give him the glory. I'm gonna give him the glory. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, love. Oh, 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 oh. Great and mighty is our God. Worthy is Jesus. Great and mighty is our God. Great and mighty is our Savior. And he's doing a mighty work for you right now. I believe and I stand in agreement with every petition that God is going to do exactly what he promised. Because great and mighty is our Father. Great and mighty is our Savior. Great and mighty is our God. There's no God like him. There's no God before him. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. Thank you, God. Thank you. Come on, this song is just talking about how great and mighty he is. When you get the words, I want you to sing with us. Hallelujah. Come on. It says this. Sing. Great and mighty are you, Lord, our great and matchless King. Great and mighty are you, Lord, forever we will sing. Great and mighty are you, Lord, our great and matchless King. Great and mighty are you, Lord, forever we will sing. Come on, put your hands on it. Our great and matchless King. Great and mighty.
Let's do it again. Right here. Great and mighty are you, Lord. Say.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is so faithful. God is good. While Kenny and the praise team was ministering, just it's just so good to be in the presence of the Lord. But listen to me. The Bible says where praise is, he inhabits the praises of his people. So it's not really about you being in the building. It's about being available and allowing God to access wherever you are occupying right now. So whether you are in your living room or your home office or your families are around the television in the living room, make your home a sanctuary right now. Make your cubicle if you're at work just for the moment. Just, just, just praise him. This is where the Bible, this is where the outward appearance doesn't matter. God sees your heart. I know you can't shout at your cubicle, but you can you can raise a praise in your heart. You can say, God, I thank you that you're still providing, that you're still making a way. I want you in the comment section, if you know that God has been good, I want you to type in the comment section, he's been good. Show me the emojis, the praise hands. Let me know that he, the God that we serve has been good to you. He woke us up early this morning and he started us on our way. Yeah, we, don't have, we lost an hour of sleep, but I promise you that if you give God praise, he will move on your behalf. I'm trying to hold it together here, but I, I'm just grateful to be alive and to be in the presence of the Lord. Listen, I want to say welcome to, to our worship experience. No matter where you are watching, we want to say welcome. Welcome to all of you who are watching for the first time. I want to say thank you for sacrificing getting up after losing your hour uh, of sleep but to be here with us this morning thank you for inviting us into your homes and i want you to know that our church our church this ministry is about being a place of refreshing about us being a place where it doesn't matter where you are in your life that you can come and be refreshed and restored that God can pour back into you no matter where you are, whether you're in the building physically or if you're watching uh, on the screen. That I want you to know that that's why we're here. We want to be able to bring life to you. We want to be able to minister to you. And we're believing that God is doing it. And listen, I, I am grateful for all of you who have shared this. I'm grateful and I'm appreciative of all of you who are commenting and letting other people know about this ministry. God has blessed us. He's continuing to bless us. People are literally watching from all over the world. Literally seeing people, whether you're watching on Facebook or online or through the app. Uh, uh, we're seeing people posting, I'm watching from South Africa. Amazing that God is allowing people from all over the world to experience what he's doing here in Columbia, South Carolina. And whether you are here locally or our family abroad, we want to say we love you. We want to say that we miss you. We want to say that we are praying for you. And I want you to know that the best is yet to come. I believe that. And if you do, I want you to just give God a 10 second praise wherever you are because the best truly is yet to come. Listen, we're preparing our hearts to give. We we want you to know because of your giving, we're able to do ministry. And I want to say thank you for those who, you know, people oftentimes look at us and say, man, the pastors were holding it down in 2020 and, you know, all that. And it was hard. It was difficult. It was challenging, not just for me, but many others and even yourself. But this is the one thing I want you to know. You're the real MVP. Because if you weren't consistently giving, if you were not consistently tithing, if you didn't believe in this ministry, all of this could have crumbled. But because of people like you who continue to give, who believe in God's word, and they believe that if they would give 10 percent, that God would open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing in their lives that they would not have room enough to receive. I want to say thank you. Thank you. I say it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Because you could do this or you could give any place else before you to think and consider us, we want to say thank you. We believe you're good ground. So if we're good ground, I believe you're going to see a harvest in your life. Also, I want to say to you that we are continuing to do ministry. We're continuing to constantly pour into the community and do things. So even though it's not visible, we trust me, we're still doing ministry. And we're able to do that because of you. So we're going to pray. And then we're going to transition and believe God and prepare our hearts for the worst. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for both gift and giver. We thank you for the seed we're getting ready to sow. Father, I pray that you will bless the person who is giving. 
But Father, I would ask that you will also bless the person who wanted to give, but at this moment, they just don't have it. And God, I pray that you would allow them to experience increase. God, I pray that you won't allow them to go under, but God, I pray that you would keep them afloat. We thank you even through economic uncertainty, even though, even through difficulty, even through challenges. God, you, you're good and you're honest. And you said that you would provide for us. David said, I was young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed beg bread. God, cover your people, strengthen your people, provide for your people. And we thank you and we give you glory in Jesus name. Amen. At this time, I want to share something else with you. And just like that, I'm done. I texted the Brook to 73256. That's how I give. And we want to say thank you for giving, because without your contribution, we wouldn't be able to do what we do for the church and our community. After this, we're going to show you a short video. It'll go through the steps on how to securely and quickly give by texting the Brook to 73256. Remember, we're not living where we're giving, but we're sowing where we're going. Love Week is here, and one of our big events that we're doing is we are giving the gift of life by donating blood. I want you to meet me and my friends here March 17th from 12 to 6. We want you to join us as we donate blood to help the lives of others. You can visit our website and the app to get registered. I hope to see you there. I'm so glad that you are here once again. To all of our first-time visitors, thank you so much for worshiping with us today, and everyone just around the world. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. I want you to grab your Bibles, your iPads, your tablets, whatever you have, and go with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12. But before we get into the Word and why you're getting that, I want you to understand that we are a ministry continuing to bless our community. This Wednesday, well, actually next week, starting tomorrow, not next week, starting tomorrow, we're doing something called Love Week, and we're doing something special every single day to touch people in our community. So it doesn't matter whether you're in Columbia or if you are in the state of Michigan, Texas, Washington State, South Africa, Germany, Japan, no matter where you're watching from, you have the opportunity to show love this week. Sometimes people uh, may, may understand, like, what is the ministry and what does that entail? It requires us being the hands and feet of Jesus. When the Bible speaks about ministers, it is not a rank or a position within the church. He said that we were all ministers, which means that we all serve. We all do something. So this week, we are doing ministry We in each and every single day. I want you to visit the website to get more information about what we're doing. But Wednesday specifically is what I want to highlight. Wednesday, we're giving blood. We've all been impacted by COVID-19, and there are people who need blood. What better way to give life than giving blood? So if you don't mind, I would love for you if you're available, and even if you are comfortable with giving blood this week. Once again, whether you're here locally, maybe you can give and partner with the American Red Cross in your city, but we want to give blood on Wednesday. So today, excuse me, on Wednesday, not today, on Wednesday, we want from 12 to 6, we want to give blood and give life back to those who need it. So we would love for you to consider that uh, as we continue to minister to those in our community. So with that being said, I'm going to transition to the words So 2 Samuel, beginning at Verse 1 of chapter 12 says this. The Lord sent Nathan to David. And when he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle. But the poor man had nothing except the one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and grew it up with him and his children. He shared his food, drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. 
it was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I want to use as a subject today, it's going to be a little heavy, but I pray it is a blessing to you. I want to use as a subject how to have a hard conversation. How to have a hard conversation. Some people have the mindset that if I don't address something, it will eventually go away. And because of that, they ignore certain things that have taken place in their lives or what has happened to others. But to ignore means to intentionally refuse to take notice or to acknowledge someone or something. And so while we think we, because they don't know how to articulate the things that they're feeling, they simply hold on to it, harbor to the point that sometimes it affects them physically, emotionally, even spiritually. And if we are going to really experience deliverance, we're going to have to have some hard conversations. But I think the reason why we don't have these conversations, to be honest with you, is because we have not been taught how to have them. Because there, 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 there are things we have to learn about having a hard conversation because we have to learn how to confront without offending. And most people don't know how to do that because we have never been taught. So I want to share with you how to have a hard conversation. The first thing I want you to write down is prepare. Anytime you're getting ready to have a hard conversation, you have to prepare for it. It's like someone who works out. When they go to the gym, they need to first stretch or they need to warm up their muscles before they start lifting heavy. Otherwise, injury will occur. And it's the same way about having a hard conversation. You have to prepare yourself to make sure that you are good. Being prepared is extremely important. And being prepared to have the hard conversation, one of the things you have to do to prepare is to make sure, listen to me, that your intentions of having the conversation are pure. Your intentions of having the conversation has to be pure. Now, this is, it. This is the first stage, so you got to check yourself before you say a word. Am I saying this because I'm trying to get revenge? Am I, am I having this conversation because I want to get something off my chest? Am I, am I, am I having this conversation because... I want to do something or I'm looking for a response. You have to make sure that your intentions are pure and you have to make sure your heart is not toxic. This is in the preparation stage because if you move into having the hard conversation without having a true conversation with yourself about how you really feel about that thing that happened to you, you can walk into that situation and cause more harm than healing. So we have to make sure that we are prepared. See, when, when Nathan, the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1, that the Lord sent Nathan. So Nathan isn't coming to David because he has motives. He's not coming to David because he has uh, 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 some, some different intention. He's not coming to David because he wants something. He's not coming to David because he's envious or jealous. He has pure motives. He has nothing to lose. The only thing he has to do is deliver. Deliver the message to David. He, he, he has no hidden agenda. He, there's nothing behind what he's saying but what it is. And when you look at it, Nathan has to prepare himself to speak to David. And how, how, how does he prepare himself? He says, in order for David to get it, I'm going to have to relay this message in a way that David can get it. 
because every person isn't the same. Question uh, number 1A uh, is, do you know who you have to confront? Or 1B, do you, know, do you know who you're confronting? The reason why this is important is because if you don't know the person's personality, you can engage them in this conversation and offend them and not get the results you need. Some people you don't need to yell at. Most people you don't have to yell at. Sometimes you're yelling because you want to be heard. But the point of the conversation is not to be heard. The point of the conversation is to come to a resolution. It's to come to a place where we can fix this thing and move on. But, but you have to know the person. Nathan knew David would, would respond, but he had to present it in a way that David could get it. So Nathan said, how am I going to talk to David about what he did? He didn't. Saw this man's wife, pursued her. She got pregnant. He tried to cover it up. Since the, the man wouldn't go home to be with his wife, he gives him his own death sentence. He goes and he dies in war. Now that he's dead, Bathsheba has mourned his death. Now, David goes to the house, picks her up, brings her back to the palace, and the Bible says this. She becomes one of the other wives. And you thought you got away with it. So God has to speak to Nathan, who knows nothing about the situation. See, I want you to know that God still speaks to people. And just because someone didn't say it don't mean they didn't see it. There are some people who see stuff on you, but they don't say anything because you're not ready to receive what they will say. And so David says, or David just does this, and Nathan says, I have to address it, but how will David receive the message? Nathan says, I know exactly what to do. I'll tell him a story. There was a rich man, David. He walks in the room. David says, hey, Nate, so good to see you. He says, yeah, man, so, so glad to be here, but you know, I want to just talk, you know, just want to share a story with you. There was a rich man. There was a poor man. Poor man bought this one little lamb, and uh, he, grew, he, he grew with that lamb, fed that lamb, did everything for that lamb. There was a rich man. He had all of these lambs, and he had a friend that come in town. And the rich man, instead of taking one of his lamb, went and took the poor man's one little lamb, killed it, sacrificed it, and prepared it as a meal for his guests. David gets mad. This man should be killed. Nate said, yeah, by the way, you're the guy. David stops in his tracks because he did not know that he knew. But he knew how to get the message to him. So here it is. So when you're getting ready to have the conversation Point number two is this. What's the purpose or the desired outcome? This is extremely important because if you don't have an outcome, because what, what God wanted from David was for him to repent. Every outcome isn't always about a repentance, right? It isn't about change, but it isn't always about some sin issue. So here it is. There was, God was unhappy with what David did. The purpose and the goal should be achieved by how you approach them. So you're, the goal is not for you to give them a piece of your mind. The goal is not for you to get something off your chest. The goal is not for you to run a guilt trip. The goal isn't for you to tell them off. That's not the goal. The goal is to come to a resolution. How do you do this? When you approach someone, one of the things you must understand is that you have to own it. What's the outcome? So, for example, I was reading a book, um, and this pertains to marriage, but I'll, I'll give this example. There was a pastor, and um, this pastor, this particular woman felt called to help the first family of the church. And so he had a wife, and the, the, the wife um, found out that the, the pastor was getting help from an attractive female in the church. And so the woman would call the pastor every now and then to encourage him. 
and it made the wife uncomfortable. Um, so uh, ever so often, she would go to the church, and she would be there helping with stuff and just made the wife uncomfortable. So the wife was like, I, I have to say something about this. I have to address this. So she goes to her husband and says, listen, like this is really making me uncomfortable, and you need to really eliminate and cut off this relationship because I don't think this is, is right. And so the husband was like, man, please, this is nothing's going on. This is innocent. She's helping. She's a great help. She's helped us. She's helped you. You know, we're fine. So one day, the wife is out of town for a weekend. And when she comes home, she finds this single female in her house cooking dinner. So she comes to, she comes to, the, I feel heat coming from, from every direction right now. So, 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 so she comes home and another woman is in her kitchen cooking food for her husband and their children. So she doesn't say anything. She just smiles and she looks at her and says, thank you. And then she goes to her husband saying, listen, this isn't right. She's crossing the line. I think we need to have a conversation about this. You need to cut it off. And the, and the husband is like, please, there's nothing going on. Nothing is happening. So finally, she calls the girl up and she says, look, let's have lunch. And she says this to her. I believe we both want our pastor to have a reputation that is not flawed by bad choices. And we have to make sure that we do what's best for him and the ministry because his reputation is extremely important. And I don't believe that some of the things you're doing is helping with that. The girl starts crying. She says, I won't offer my help anymore. I was just trying to help. I didn't mean anything by it. I didn't want your husband. I'm not attracted to your husband. I just felt called to help. She said, I got that. It's just that you cross lines. And because this is becoming a problem, we need to end this. Here's the issue. The pastor should have been the one to have the conversation, number one. So in, in your case, take the pastor out of it. What situations are you avoiding? Because you don't want to have the hard conversation. So now the husband, the pastor made the wife handle the situation. But now the pastor don't like the way she handled it, but he didn't have to be mad about how she handled it. If he would have handled it, right? So now the girl's hurt. Now she's claiming church hurt when she cannot see that she was out of bounds. Now, what the lady did was this. She said, I saw, and we need to address. So when you have a confrontation or a hard conversation, you have to own it. You can't walk and say, hey, you know the word on the street is. You have to own it. You have to say, I see this. If you're working, if you're a leader or a manager or, or you lead in some capacity in a professional cons in, in, uh, uh, perspective or you have a professional seat and you have to address them, you say, hey, you know what? I'm seeing some things here that I would like to talk to you about. And I think we can work on this if we work this out. You see that? Not, hey, everybody's saying this. And if you don't stop, everybody's going to continue to. You made it worse. So if you're going to have a conversation, you have to own it. Are you with me? You have to own it. So you have to own it. That makes it better. Uh, point number three. Here it is. Not only do we need to prepare for it, not only do we need to have a purpose or a desired outcome, the third thing is this, the place. Where are you going to have this conversation? Where you have the conversation depends on the relationship you have with the person you have to confront. If it's a violent situation, I don't think you need to invite them to your home. All right? We need to meet in a neutral place, a parking lot, lots of lights. In the middle of the day, where a lot of people there. <laughs> right? All right. So <laughs> we might need to have a conversation at a restaurant over some food. Because you ain't going to act but so crazy, hopefully, at the restaurant. No, but you have to get a neutral location. Look at it in John 4 when Jesus, Jesus says, I need to go do Samaria. That's the King James Version. I need to go do Samaria. But he meets a woman at the well. 
This is a neutral place. So now Jesus can have a conversation about her, about worship, and all the other things that's going on in her life because it's in a neutral spot. Jesus is not in her house telling her about herself. You can't go to somebody's house to read them their rights. That's not going to work out well. Okay? And you don't need to invite them to your house either. You need to find a neutral place where you can have the hard conversation, whether it's a parking lot, a restaurant, Starbucks, outside. But you have to find the place. The place is also important. It needs to be neutral ground. Are you hearing me? Point number four. This is probably one of the most important things. Timing. The time in which you have the conversation is just as important as the place you choose, the purpose of it, and how you prepare. Because you can be prepared, you can have the right place, you can have the right outcome, but if you do it at the wrong time, it all goes down the drain. So what's happening? The text shares with us that Bathsheba at this point already had the baby. So the baby is living. The baby is born. So we got at least nine months. We don't know how, exactly how old the baby is, but we at least are assuming we have nine months to 12 months. It could be longer. By this time, the whole situation is numb to David. So this is why he was blindsided by the story, because he thought it was over with. But God wasn't done with it. So now when he comes to David, David is in a place to finally receive it. Here's the timing tip. The person has to be at the right place and they have to be right. You have to choose the right time in which they can receive it. So timing is about finding the right time to say it to them that they can receive it, not when you want to give it. Hey, look, you're a little reckless. Now, some things, now here, here's the challenge, because you got some people, and I know you're watching me, please, please don't do any tomatoes. There's some of you watching this, this, <laughs> this stream right now, you like, you the immediate responder. Soon as it pops up, oh, wait a minute, we could talk about this right now. Like, this, this ain't going on one more minute. We talking about this right now. Others of us are like, uh, I'll wait. And you wait, and you wait, and you wait. There has to be a balance. There are certain things you need to discuss in the moment, and there are other things you need to discuss later. But if you discuss the right thing at the wrong time, it won't be received. It goes against the desired outcome. You want the outcome. Are you with me? I know this isn't exciting, but I promise you this is going to help you because some of y'all need to have some conversations that this is why you're struggling. Because you're talking to everybody about that except to the person you need to talk to. Are you with me? And so, and sometimes people don't think, so let me share this. As your pastor, it's my responsibility to, to watch over your soul. That's your, the, the, your will, your emotions, your thoughts, your, all that. I'm responsible to lead you and grow you spiritually in that area. And one of the areas that we are seeing lack of maturity is responsibility on conflict management. We don't know how to have a hard conversation. So, we, so in church, what we'll do is we say stuff like, I'm going to pray about it. Oh, let, let's turn on our plate and fast about that. I'm not against praying and I'm not against fasting. What I'm saying is sometimes we like to use these spiritual things to mask what we need to just simply talk about. We don't need to pray about this. I just need you to answer my question. That's it. I want to know why you will not wash the dishes. We don't need to fast over that. I just need you to take the dish, get some soap, some water in the rag, wipe on, <laughs> wipe off. That's, it's, it's simple. We don't, I just want to know why you keep avoiding the conversation. I just want to know why every time this happens, you catch an attitude. I want to know why every time something comes up, you always running, but yet you're the first one 
to give God praise, but you're the, you're the most dysfunctional one in the group. And you haven't learned yet that just because you learned the new church gig or jig or dance or move does not mean that you're delivering. I have to tell you, when the Bible speaks about praise, it is our response of thanksgiving to God for what he's done, what he's doing, what he will continue to do. And oftentimes we are praising him for who he is. Listen to me. If we get stuck on this principle that is not entirely true, that praise breaks it. Praise, praise breaks some stuff, but praise don't break everything. Are you, are you with me? Praise handles some stuff, but praise don't fix everything. You sick, praise them. No, you need to eat better. You need to exercise, right? You need to, you need to make some changes about what you, you need to walk. You need, no, I'm serious. So what, what we want to, oh, praise. No, you got an attitude problem. You need counseling. You need a couch. You, you're depressed. You, you need some, someone to talk to you. We need to uproot some stuff. So then people come to church looking for church to be the drug to numb what they're trying to avoid. And so we never have the hard conversation. But this is why Jesus gives us an example when he goes to Samaria. When he go, when, when Nathan goes to David and says, hey, man, this is what you did. David repents. He repents immediately. God, I'm sorry for what I did. He says, Give me a clean heart. Renew, watch this, the right spirit because I was operating in the wrong one. So when that person recognizes that they were operating in the wrong spirit, then now they can change for the better to get the outcome. So if you're doing something that is, if someone is doing something that is hurting you, you simply go to them and say, listen, I love you, I appreciate you, but when you do this, it makes me feel like this. And I don't know if you know that, but I just, I would prefer if you stop that because it doesn't make me feel good when you do that. Now, if the person is ignoring what you're saying, you have to pray that God changes their hearts. Because this is why the Bible says, if you go to your brother, number one, I don't know what point, this might be five or six, go to them one-on-one. -on -one. Don't send them a text. How are you going to handle a serious matter through text messages? I just want to let you know. The other day, when you came to the room, you said this, that, and the third, and it took everything in me. Now, and this is long. It's a book. No, you sit down face to face. Because number one, here it is, you are believing that the person you're leaving it up to the person to hear the tone of the text. Because another part of communication is not just what to say, it's how you say it. It's called tone. I could say, y'all better sing. I could say, y'all better sing. I could say, yeah, I better sing. Great job. Great job. Great job. So when you send a text, the tone, you don't know the mood that the person is in that you send in the text. So now they read the words and they got an attitude. So they read the text with an attitude that you didn't send. So they respond with another book. And now we got an argument, which would have never happened if you would have been brave enough to say, can you meet me somewhere for us to have a conversation? Oh, I'm helping. There are certain things you can't solve with an email. You just got to talk it out. And it's okay. You have to agree sometimes to disagree. 
Sometimes you have to, you can help somebody and they don't listen. You just have to say, okay, well, you don't get it, no problem. I'll let, I'll let you know. I just want, I'm here for you because you know they're getting ready to bump their head. So you just go and have your bandages ready so when they bump their head, you can say, here you go. And they move and they appreciate you and then they'll listen to you the next time. But we can't be afraid to have conversation. This is why people who are, I'm not coming for nobody, but hear me out. You have to be careful if you have a passive, aggressive approach because you'll be nice, nasty. And they act like you were nasty. When you knew you was nasty, but you knew how to put some nice on it. <laughs> Boy, I would, man, put me an E flat, Mark. I'm just, I'm just playing. I just, <laughs> you, right? You, or some people who are aggressive and they're brash and they want to just tell everybody. And please, I promise you, this is not Bible, but I think this is a 100% accurate statement. Most people who dish it, can't take it. They want to tell everybody off. You say one. So, so when you have, here it, here it is. So when you've been mishandled in the conversation, it is now for you to take the lesson to learn how to handle someone else when you need to have the conversation. This is what Jesus did in John chapter 4 when he saw the young lady at the well. He looked at her. He said, I need something to drink. She said, what? <laughs> You're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, what you need something to drink for? Here it is, another man trying to holler at me. Jesus said, well, you knew who you talked to. You'd be asking me for something to drink. She said, oh, here we go. You asked me for something to drink. You don't have no cup to get nothing out the well. Now you flipped it, talking about if, you, if I knew who you were, I'd be asking you for, well, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? He goes on and says, yeah, you know, don't worry about this. That. So tell me about your husband. She said, well, you know, I had some relationship challenges. It's been up and down. It's been rocky. He said, yeah. He said, so you had five husbands, and the man you with now is not yours. Now she's like, whoa, hold on, player. Like, who? you don't know me like that. But, but the conversation went in such a way that she was open to hear because she said, wait a minute. You don't know me, and you wouldn't have known that unless, here we go, unless you be a prophet. Now she's open to what else you see. So now the, the conversation is engaging. And he says, yeah, this, that, and the third, but she doesn't realize he's the seventh man. And, the, and, the, and number seven in biblical numerology means wholeness. It means complete. So now she's with six men. Six is the number of flesh, but now she gets to meet Jesus, the one who will make her whole. So now when she has that interaction with him, the Bible says that he begins to talk about worship and he begins to minister to her. And she takes all of this information and this experience and she goes back into the town and she says, come, listen, listen to her testimony. Come see a man who told me all my business. He, Jesus had the hard conversation because here it is, because God knows there's ministry in you. Because the Bible says, Jesus said, I need to go through Samaria. He never went through Samaria. He gave that word to that girl and that woman went back into the city. And that word went into Samaria and she brought all of the people out. And I came to tell you, God is trying to position you to have the hard conversation because there's ministry in you. And there are people that you have to touch, but you can't do it. If you're holding on and avoiding everybody, that's why you went to the well in the middle of the day because nobody would be there talking about you and, and talking about the stuff you've done. All of us have made mistakes. All of us have done things we're not happy about. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God, but God still sees the ministry in you. He still sees He still sees power in you. He still sees purpose in you. You still have an anointing on your life, and this is why God sent me today to tell you it's time to have the hard conversation. You can't be a man and be lazy. The Bible says if a man don't work, he don't eat. But when you're a mama's boy, you're looking for a mother in someone in your age group. But if she is, here it is, lonely enough she will pacify your foolishness because you got somebody who never will confront you on the fact that you're lazy. 
And you want to blame somebody for not having a job when the reality is men confront other men. We do stuff like this. Nah, bro, you got to step your game up. Oh, you slack. That was trash. I can't believe he said that was trash. No, yeah, that was trash. Do that over. It's all right, Johnny. It's going to be okay. It's not trash. What is someone else's trash? It's someone else's treasure. That's what women do. Men are like, that's trash. <laughs> and I'm not trying to pacify. I don't want to make that feel bad because when sometimes there's someone like, no, look, no, that was pretty bad. But they try to soften up. Men don't soften stuff up. That's trash. Do it over. You need that. Why? Because once you graduate, and you got to go work a real job. Ain't nobody over there patting you on the back, Johnny. Tell me, we're going to give you one more chance. It's like, look, this is your second strike. Do it one more time, and you're out of here. So then you run around talking about nobody likes you. Well, here we go. Everybody hating on you. Then you post it. Then we, start, then we start taking scripture to make us feel good. All things work together. <laughs> you got fired for being lazy. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Like we do, <laughs> we do stuff. I know people do stuff like this. We <laughs> the Bible says iron sharpens iron. Do you know how steel and iron is actually sharpened? It's a brutal process. Brutal. No, we don't want that. We want people to praise us. Praise what? Your foolishness? We have to have the hard conversation. Jesus saw ministry in that girl just like David had ministry in him. But if David wasn't checked, it was a possibility, Chris, he would have continued. So God is having the conversation so that you can stop. He's having the conversation so that you can change. He's having the conversation because he needs you to reposition yourself for where he's trying to take you because there's so much in you. And I want you to know that God is not doing this to punish you. He's doing this to position you. He's trying to get you to the next place where you can see the glory of God in your life and that you can experience the blessings that he has for you. He's doing this because he sees the good in you. He's doing this because he's trying to make you better. And it's time for you to have the hard conversation. And even though it may sting, it will make sure God will make sure that it makes you better because now it's your season to do better. I'm believing God is getting ready to do that you're going to experience favor in your life if you can have the hard conversation. I know it's difficult, but have the conversation. I know this is going to make you cry. I know you're going to tear up, but it's fine. He'll catch your tears in a bottle. He'll work, work all that out. But you have to make sure that you have the hard conversation because God has too much in store for you to simply let it pass. Greatness is in you. I need everybody to say after me, greatness is in me. This is why he's trying to have the conversation. I'm going to close with this. Joseph is, is sold into slavery by his brothers. He goes to jail for no reason. Potiphar's wife lies on him. He's in jail. He's, his life is up and down. Eventually, he becomes the second in charge of Egypt. A drought comes. His brothers show up. And he got the power to do whatever he wants to do. He sets it up. Eventually, he comes to his brothers. His father is dying on his deathbed. The Bible says the brothers start getting nervous because the only reason why they believe Joseph didn't do nothing to them yet is because daddy was still living. But now that daddy is about to go, Lord, what is Joseph going to do to us now? Joseph looked at his brothers and said, no, 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 don't, don't, I know what you're thinking what you meant for evil. Let me have the hard conversation now. So let me go ahead and talk to you now so you won't be stressing. What you meant for evil, God obviously meant it for good. And he allowed you to do what you did, even though it hurt, to put me in a place where I could be here to help the family. 
So don't worry about it. I forgive you. Let's move on. It was a hard conversation. We want to avoid the hard conversations. You need it to position yourself for where God is going to take you. And if they don't accept it, shake the dust off your feet and continue with your life and let God handle the rest. I want to pray for you today. I pray that today that this message has blessed you in some way, like for real. Like I want you to experience the presence of God in your life. But sometimes we, maybe we didn't see that it just comes through having a conversation. Maybe you just need to share with your spouse, I'm just really tired. Maybe you need to say, I'm extremely frustrated. Maybe you can say what's really on your heart from a place of not frustration and anger, but a place of, I just want you to know because I need your prayer and support. To be able to have a conversation with your children or a friend or a family member, watch this, even a conversation with yourself. To say, God, I need your help here. And whatever I need to do, let me do it here. And I want to pray for you today. I want you to know that God is bringing up the conversation because there's ministry in you. He doesn't want you to continue in this path where things continue to get worse, but he wants you to know that he's there for you and he has something prepared for you. So I want to pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for each and every person who's hearing this word right now. Father, I pray that you would help us prepare ourselves for the hard conversation. That you allow us to have the right intentions and the right purpose and the right outcome. But God, to also choose the right place at the right time so that we can experience healing in our lives. God, we need you to move in our lives. I pray for my brother and my sister now. I pray for each and every person under the sound of my voice so that they can experience freedom after having the conversation. God, we honor you, and we thank you for the healing that is taking place. But we also thank you for the courage that they will have to move into this new season of freedom and happiness and joy. And Father, we thank you that the enemy cannot hold us back. Every chain, every yoke be broken and destroyed. And we thank you, God, for what you're doing. I pray right now. For anyone who's getting ready to make a bad decision, a bad move, Father, I pray right now you mess up the plans. God, because they don't have enough sense not to say no, I pray you shut it down for them. We don't have time to mess up. We don't have time to waste. God, make it clear. And we pray, God, that you will keep them. And we thank you for your blessings and all that you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, there's information on the bottom of the screen that if you want to give your life to Christ, if you want to, if you want to, if you need additional prayer, I want you to know that we have people right now who are in position ready to pray for you. They're ready to pray for you right now. So if you're saying, hey, I need additional prayer, right now our social media team is putting links. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or Church Online on the website, if you're doing that, you can actually just type your prayer request there. Oh, excuse me. You can click on that link and they'll take you to the Zoom room where they're ready to pray for you. We want to see God do this for you. And we're believing God for that. So at this time, I pray that you have a phenomenal week. But before you log off, I want to make sure that you click that link. And we have some information that we want to share with you. But I want you to know that I'm believing God for you and I'm excited about your future. Stay right there. We have some more things. God has said something to you to help you in your walk with the Lord. Now listen, before you leave, there's something else that we need you to do.
for you to connect with us. So if you now, personal Lord and Savior, or you want prayer regarding the sermon that was preached today, I want you to join the prayer and salvation link that is there. We have our team waiting to welcome you and to minister to you individually. Also, if you're interested in partnering with us and becoming a member of the Brook or finding out more information about our ministry, I want you to click on the chat link uh, that says partnership so that we can get more information to you. Someone is waiting for you there. We're just so glad to have you. Whatever your need is, we're here to help meet that today. And so we want you to follow up in those links. So make sure you do that. And we want to say that we believe that God is doing awesome things in your ministry because, and in your life, because we're excited about your future.